So I remember that I too was once indoctrinated to thinking that Jesus' sole purpose was to get me to heaven. And that's not even what he himself says. He says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the, to the Father but by me. Not to heaven, to the Father. And we think, yeah, the Father, whenever we get to heaven. No, that's not what he says. He says in my Father's house, there are many mansions, abiding places. And I'm going to go and prepare a place to receive you where I am. Because don't you know? That I abide, you don't believe that I abide in my Father and my Father abides in me? And I'm going to bring you into my own abiding place in my Father. Read John's letter. Read the other letters. Jesus emphasizes that I abide in him and he abides in me. No one knows him but me. No one knows me but him. So now he's bringing us into his own abiding in the Father. And he's bringing us into his own knowing in the Father. Because in John 14, 20, he says, in that day, what you're supposed to know is not that I paid the price for you to get to heaven, but what you're supposed to know is that I am in my father and you are in me and I am in you and my father and I are going to come and make our abode. That's the same word as King James translated as mansion. We're going to come and make our abode, our home in you and you're going to be loved with his love. Okay, so whenever we think that Jesus is the right way to heaven, there's a whole bunch of doctrines created just around that idea of doing the right thing to get there, making sure we're doing the right thing to make sure that we can still get there. And we're missing the entire reality of what he is trying to point out, because what he says is this is eternal life, that you may know him, the one true God in Jesus Christ, the son whom he sent. That is eternal life. And then he says this. He says, Father, I have glorified your name on earth, having finished the work that you sent me to do. So the work that he came to finish is not this arbitrary, oh, I paid a price in order to get you into heaven. That's not what he said. He said that I came to glorify your name. I came to give them a proper opinion of you. This is how John starts out his letter. The word of God has come. No one has seen the face of God at any time, but the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has exegeted him. He has revealed him. He has given us a proper interpretation of him. So he says, I have back to John 17. I have glorified your name on earth. Having finished. I have made your name known and will continue to make it known. And then at the end of his prayer, he talks about this union, this oneness again, and this participation in his life. Father, I pray that they will be one as you and I are one. I and you, them and me, me and them, so the world would know that you sent me and have loved them with the same love that you love me with. And then he goes on to talk about making his name known and continuing to make it known unto us. And the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, is actually given to bring us into his interchange in his knowing of the Father and the love that him and the Father share. So that's why the Holy Spirit inspires believers to say two things, to acknowledge two things, to confess two things. One, Jesus Christ is Lord. Two, we have not received the spirit of a slavery to, again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. See, no eye has seen, no ear has known, neither has it entered into the heart of men the things that God has prepared for them to love him, but he has revealed them to us by his spirit, right? We have the mind of Christ and the mind of Christ is us coming into Christ's own knowing. And part Why is Jesus the only way to the father? This should be simple, but I remember whenever this was made clear to me, I'm like, Whoa. listen, because Jesus is the Logos made flesh. He is the only one that abides. He's the only one that abides. In he's the second person of the Trinity. It's not like we just needed this perfect sacrifice to get us into heaven. Yes, Jesus defeated death on our behalf as the last Adam. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That is, in itself is mind boggling. There's one God and one, one mediator between God and man. That's the man, Christ Jesus. But he's the only one who abides in the Godhead. He's the only one who abides in union with the Father. He is the only one who participates in the life of God in the communion of the Holy Spirit. So therefore, him incarnating and being made flesh, everything he does happens. Do you not know that when Christ died, you died? When Christ was raised, you were raised. When Christ is seated, you are seated. Okay, so when he dies, death can't hold him. He frees us from death as the last Adam. 
And then where he ascends, he brings us into that place of union with the father. Philippians says that we, our citizenship is in heaven from which we wait for him, right? For, we're waiting from heaven for him to be revealed and we're actually gonna be revealed with him. Listen, whenever you're constantly focused on this afterlife thing, you're missing everything that Jesus talked about because Hebrews two says that we're no longer supposed to be subject to the fear of death. He has freed us from that. John four says that we're supposed to know and believe the love that God has for us and that he sent his son into the world to save us and that we're no longer supposed to have this, this fear because he who fears has this torment and that we're not perfected in love. Basically, we just don't really believe the gospel, right? We cannot still be those people. We're supposed to be those who are working out our salvation because salvation is past tense, present tense, future tense. It's past tense in the fact that we've been delivered from the fall of Adam. We're no longer in Adam, we're in Christ. We've been delivered from sin, death, and the fall. Then there's a present tense salvation, the salvation of the soul, whereby we are learning to be the children of God in the midst, right? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because God is now at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is our participation, our fellowship in the divine nature with the empowerment of the life-giving spirit. So now that God is at work in us, both to will and to work for his good pleasure, we're learning to be the children of God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation that has not awakened to this truth that God is their father. They have not received what Christ has come to make known. They have not accepted the truth that the gospel proclaims about them. So they, no long, they don't participate in this life. They cannot receive the spirit of truth because they don't know him, right? So now that is working out our salvation. That is a present tense. Then there's a future salvation to where we get new incorruptible bodies. But remember, it says that sin, since you died with him, were raised with him and now abide with him. Sin should no longer raise, uh, sin should no longer reign in our mortal bodies. These bodies right here that are subject to corruption. It says, since that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now abides or dwells in you, he gives this life to your mortal bodies, these bodies right here. That's not talking about the resurrection. That's talking about, just go and read it in Romans chapter eight. So we no longer, we're indebted, but not to the flesh to fulfill it, but we're indebted to the spirit to put off those deeds. And we have not received the spirit of slavery again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption because, because we are sons. He has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts again, crying uh, by father, Galatians chapter four. So the Holy spirit, the spirit of truth, who has given us the mind of Christ is awakening us to this reality, testifying of what Jesus testifies of is that God is your father. I'm making your name known. I'm bringing you into that thing that I hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, into this mystery that God was working out since before the world began. This truth that we were created to be sons in the son who is the true image. So now where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we all with unveiled face, beholding us in the mirror, the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into that very same image from glory to glory. So the Holy Spirit is transforming us into the image of Christ, Romans 8. We have been predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ. And it's not just about whether I'm getting to heaven or not. And we'll spend our whole life worried about whether we're doing the right thing to get to heaven. When Jesus says, you can't get here, there is no boasting. I'm going to come and rescue you bring you to where I am. You get to abide where I am. And now in participation in my life, because my father is the vine dresser, I am the brand, a vine, you are the branches. You can't do anything of yourself. And now that I've brought you into this participation of where I am, I'm gonna teach you how to be the children of God that you were created to be in me. Now let's start there. And don't worry, I took care of the heaven part. You'll be with me forever. But learn to be the children of God that you are so that you can represent me correctly. I love y'all. I hope this helped and I'll talk to y'all next time.